Hi everyone, I'm Jose Algarin, Program Specialist for the Climate Variability and Predictability Program, CBP, at NOAA's Climate Program Office. Thank you so much for joining us today for the second session of the webinar series called Decada Variability and Predictability Series. This is a continuation of a series of webinars for the CBP program that started several years ago. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available at the CBP website under the webinars tab. If you missed any of the prior CBP webinars, including last week's, I encourage you to view them from our website. CBP supports research that enhances our process level understanding of the climate system through observation, modeling, analysis, and field studies. The topic of this series is the Decato Climate Variability and Predictability Studies. The call for these studies was CBP's contribution to the national and international research interest in this topic, especially the role of the ocean. This webinar series covers the 10 projects funded by CBP, which started in September 2020. The goal of these modeling studies is to identify the state, mechanisms, and sources of climate predictability on the interannual to decadal timescale. The research will lead to future improvements in skillful decadal prediction systems for climate, ocean, and atmosphere. Each of the sessions will feature two presentations and will run until June 8, 2023. This series of presentations will share the latest results from these projects and will allow the researchers to discuss the importance of their work, outcomes, and lessons learned with a broader scientific community. We hope you will enjoy today's talks and ask plenty of questions. Speaking of questions, if you have one for our presenters, please use the raise your hand feature, which you can find on the control panel for GoToWebinar. At the end of the presentation, I will unmute those who have raised their hands so that they can ask their questions. You will also need to unmute yourself after you do so here. If you have audio problems, I will ask you to type the question in the questions box, which can also be found on the control panel. Now let's get into the presentations. Our first speaker today is Dr. Shen Yu Lu. He's the Thomas Professor of Climate Dynamics in the Department of Geography at The Ohio State University. His research includes works on ocean atmosphere interaction, climate variability and climate change of the past, present and future. Dr. Liu, thank you so much for joining us. At this time, I will turn over the controls to you. Uh, thank you very much, Jose, and uh, thank you all uh, attendees. Uh, show my screen. Okay, uh, so can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, so I'd like to uh, report uh, the progress in our project. Uh, it's based on one paper just come out on general climate, uh, the strong red noise ocean force forcing. Uh, assessed from the surface heat flux on uh, Atlantic multi-decade variability. So it's a collaboration with uh, my student Pengu and uh, Dr. Uh, Delwis in uh, NOAA, GFDL. So the highlights is that we developed a new theory, stockhouse climb theory, that shows that a red noise forcing is necessary for the surface heat flux ST correlation reverse sign with time scale from positive to negative with time scale. And furthermore, we developed a method that uh, can practically estimate uh, decadal ocean forcing magnitude in this time scale. And then we apply this to uh, the observation uh, OA flux and also uh, to the GFDL speed. Uh, so the idea was from uh, Piakni's idea a long time ago. What he uh, proposed is that uh, uh, the, the heat flux can tell you some information about uh, the, the role of ocean, okay? And uh, so if, if the atmosphere, if you got warm ST, if it's forced by the atmosphere, uh, stochastic noise, then you should see the heat flux going downward. So that will be positive heat flux, warming up, warm up. However, if you have a normally warm, but heat flux is negative, going this way, then uh, uh, it'll be the ocean forcing. And uh, he suggested that this might be the case for short time scale, interannual time scale, this might be the case for decadal time scale. So I call it uh, 
scope approach, like a doctor just uh, trying to diagnose your illness from the stethoscope. Uh, uh, one, one important, it was an idea, a uh, very crude observation, but I think one very important uh, application was starting this seriously was uh, this uh, Gulliver paper. What they used was one, about 100, uh, over 100 years, uh, heat flux data. Because this approach, the hard part of the heat flux, SST we always have, the heat flux. Uh, it's a quarterly, uh, it's a seasonal heat flux data in North Landing. So they were able to identify that the heat flux at short time scale before you filter that, it is positive, so that's going downward. And but when you fill down the decay of variability, it becomes uh, becomes it becomes becomes uh, negative. So uh, it shows the evidence in observation that uh, the for longer time scale, uh, the ocean forcing is likely to be uh, responsible. And uh, you can see this. This is a robust feature. Now we tested this using different different uh, data using OA flux, which is a monthly data, or use uh, Goliva in different time periods, if, if 58 to present, or he already used 1980, 80. Uh, but anyway, all of them show robustly uh, the correlation. At short times, this is a running mean time scale. This is a correlation, zero correlation between heat flux and uh, ST in the mid latitude region. So you can see at short time scale, it is positive, but at long time scale, it becomes negative. So it just confirm it's a very robust feature uh, in, 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 in the observation. Now you can see this more comprehensively from this diagram. This diagram again shows the correlation between heat flux and SST. But this X is the VLAC, this X is running mean. So you can see that uh, this plot shows right, basically show that VLAC zero. So at VLAC zero, uh, or shorter running mean, it was positive, eventually it become negative, okay? And uh, the same thing in GFDL spear low, and uh, you can see that a similar feature. So basically in GFDL uh, spear low in the mid latitude, they also reverse sign a correlation from interannual positive to decadal negative. Uh, but there's a, a interesting uh, uh, discussion about this, uh, Amy Clement, uh, a few years ago, uh, suggested that uh, the observed uh, AMA uh, might be just, uh, you don't, you just need a slab ocean, you don't need a true ocean forcing. So they show that in the model that with uh, ocean, uh, slab ocean only, you generate similar pattern and the power spectrum, uh, it's very hard to tell uh, the difference in the, at least in the observation. Then uh, Rong Zhang, Rong Zhang uh, suggested that well, if you compare the fully coupled model with the slab coupled ocean model, you can see that at low frequency, the fully coupled model is reverse sign to negative. That's consistent with the ocean forcing. But uh, the slab ocean model here, it just still remains uh, positive. So it actually implies that uh, this, because there's no ocean forcing here, so it, no matter what time scale, it is, it's always positive. And Mark King went further. Uh, he went in the theory. He showed that actually, yes, maybe you can get an active at low frequency, but you only need a tiny bit ocean force and to cause this. Then Ron John went further and said, okay, in that model, because Mark King's model, he neglected ocean forcing damping. But if you if you include ocean forcing damping, which you can estimate from sea surface salinity to some extent, and uh, you find that you do need a at least a comparable ocean forcing with atmosphere to produce the, uh, the negative uh, reversal. So uh, put it here uh, in the context of a theory here. Uh, the transition from a positive correlation unfiltered to negative correlation, uh, we will show that in the theory, it requires red noise ocean forcing. And uh, it, you can show this comprehensively in three approaches. One is a traditional uh, low pass correlation. You go from low uh, unfiltered eventual change that. The other one, you can actually use coherence analysis, low frequency versus high frequency. You will see the reversal. And the other interesting one is you can just use unfiltered, but go to the long lead. 
Uh, so you can also show that. So their theory, you can see the relation between correlation and coherence. So it makes sense. Uh, but theoretically, uh, let's look at this. This is a Hessemann model. Hessemann model has a damping of the uh, of the SST from the surface heat flux and a stochastic forcing from the atmosphere. Then marking add another ocean forcing, stochastic forcing in this term. Then Rongjiang add another for term that is you have a damping. This ocean forcing has a finite uh, damping rate, uh, uh, which she diagnosed from sea surface salinity because salinity does not have a uh, negative ocean atmosphere heat back from uh, from uh, heat flux. So, uh, so what are we adding here in the theory is say that this ocean forcing has to be a red noise. Otherwise, you will be the correlation will be always positive if atmosphere is dominant or negative if ocean is dominant. So if you have the reversal, as we have seen in the observation in the sphere, it implies the ocean stock is forcing actually is a red noise forcing. It has to change. It will be forced by a mysterious, I call it stochastic ocean K forcing. Uh, this is white, but then there's a finite damping rate. Okay, so that becomes the red noise. Uh, so let's see, in this theory, you can see the sign reversal three approaches. As I said before, you can see the sign reversal from low pass correlation from here to here. So it reverse from positive to negative. This is a heat flux SD, uh, uh, SD correlation, this observation. The second approach you can see is that you can see this reversal. When the, atom, when the oh, this is a uh, ocean, uh, this atmosphere leading, atmosphere uh, leading, uh, this is the atmosphere leading. So uh, if you don't have, if you don't, sorry, this ocean leading, I guess, if, the, if you don't have ocean forcing, it has to be positive uh, all the time because it's an, always atmosphere forcing. However, however, if you have sufficient ocean forcing, this will also reverse sign from positive to negative. So this is also indication that ocean forcing is, uh, is red, red noise ocean forcing is acting, reversing the sign. The third approach is look at coherence analysis. Look at the real part, because the real part of coherence is basically the correlation at zero length. So you can see that from, from high frequency positive to low frequency negative, okay? So this is basically consistent in this. So the sign reversal of this red noise ocean forcing, uh, you can see this in three approaches. You can derive this uh, analytically uh, uh, approach. Uh, so uh, this one, I showed you the observation. This just shows one theory, simple theory, uh, standard theory. You can see the approach changing sign from here. That's a low pass, cor low pass correlation approach, changing from positive to negative. This is a long lead approach if from positive to negative. Uh, then there's coherence corresponding to this, the coherence changes from positive to negative. And this is the one uh, in sphere model because one of our objective of the proposal is to study sphere model compared with observation. And uh, we fitting a model, fitting a, a parameter, model parameter to this after a method we'll introduce at the end. And then you, uh, you just do the same thing uh, uh, correlation, you run it, you run correlation. So you can see that it captures major feature uh, of this. You change your sign in when you do running mean, or you change your sign, no running mean, but monthly data, but you just go to very long lead. They also change your sign. Or you look at coherence, okay? The coherence also change your sign from high frequency to low frequency, positive to negative. And uh, in general, uh, you can actually form a theory. You can see this uh, in this regime. This X is basically the forcing ratio of ocean versus atmosphere in, the, in a way, scaled by its damping rate. Let's forget the damping rate for now. Okay, think about this is stronger ocean forcing going this way. This X is the time scale of the ocean forcing. But regarding the ocean forcing time scale, if you think about this one going this direction, you can see that when that means for fixed ocean time scale, when you increase ocean forcing magnitude, 
it always goes through what is plotting is uh, the, the three regimes. First, in this regime, when the ocean forcing is smaller than one, than the atmosphere, then it's always positive. That is because just as I said, atmosphere forcing is so dominant, no matter what ocean you, time scale you have here, it's always positive. When you go to ocean very strong here, then the surface heat flux is always negative. The low pass heat flux is always negative. So uh, no matter uh, what is the time scale, it's the ocean forcing so dominant. The reversal happened in the middle, in the, this regime. In this regime, uh, you pick a place, the control shows the time of the low pass beyond the window, beyond which it is reverse itself. So, uh, so, uh, so this is the intermediate regime where the ocean forcing uh, is intermediate, and uh, but it's larger than one here, uh, if it's a comparable uh, damping rate, then the heat flux ST will reverse. So it will be this regime. And you can also see this in the other two approach, which I'm not going to go go to that. Now we go to the second part. It's all nice to have a theory, but how do you fit observation or fit a diagnose a, a, a model, which was our original purpose? And it turns out that we can design a practical scheme to estimate ocean forcing. Okay, so uh, so there are uh, first two steps to estimate the magnitude. Uh, it's basically a residual uh, approach using monthly data and the estimating feedback, estimating uh, damping rate from SST, from salinity, and, and from heat flux feedback, a couple of things. Uh, then uh, there's three sub-steps, which I'm not going to go to detail. You, you, then you get a, 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 the atmosphere ocean stochastic forcing. But the raw forcing is very, uh, uh, has very high uh, uh, error in, in high frequency, just because the way you do residual is always a problem. You got lots of problem with residual and lots of noise, especially this random noise. So what it is, but however, what is robust in this approach is that when you go to low pass, go to very low low pass limit, you filter out those high frequency noise. The final result, the ratio between the ocean animals forcing, is very robust. Okay, so this is very robust. So now you can see this here. This is the way you took the uh, spear in mid latitude. Uh, so in this approach, you keep doing the running mean, running mean, running mean. Then the ratio, you can see initially, it's just uh, very noisy just because it's meaningful because not really meaningful because lots of noise. But eventually it stabilizes to, in this case, to about one, okay? Now you can do coherence analysis, the same thing. The coherence analysis, when you go to very low frequency limit, it's also about one. So this two consistently give you this estimation at low frequency limit, uh, uh, the, the ocean forcing with atmosphere forcing magnitude variance is about one in the mid latitude sphere case. For the OA flux, actually it's bigger, the mid latitude. You do the same thing, it stabilizes, and uh, you can see that it's four. So the stand, so the, the, the magnitude is twice bigger, the ocean forcing than the atmosphere forcing at low frequency, okay? Not at high frequency, high frequency, of course, atmosphere is dominant. The other thing we can further estimate is the time scale of grid noise forcing. Because once we know this, this uh, in the ocean forcing, there are two things. One is this original Y noise, I call it K forcing. Uh, maybe like a convection entrainment or something, very fast time scale ocean forcing. But there is a time scale of this ocean forcing here. So knowing this, we, we have two unknowns. So we still need one more equation to, to, to separate apart. And it turns out that when we have a reversal, the reversal time uh, is a function of the, as I showed before, of the forcing magnitude and uh, the time scale. So by doing this, you can reverse the function and find the, the, so we know this because we know when it's reverse and we know the forcing we already have, then we can reverse, get this damping time scale. So this is one example and showing you the middle, uh, the two examples I showed you before, how do we find that uh, the time scale? So in mid latitude uh, uh, sphere, for example, the time scale is here. The B is the uh, SST damping time scale. This is a 20 means it's 20 times bigger than SST damping time scale. It's very long, okay? The magnitude is here. The effect magnitude, ocean forcing is uh, much higher than the, the atmosphere forcing. In, in 
in the OA flux observation is here, it's here. So, uh, uh, so the, the still the, the damping time scale is like three, four times longer than SST damping time scale. And the magnitude uh, is uh, larger than one as we saw before it was twice, okay. So, uh, so this is the, uh, the theory uh, on that. So uh, in summary, uh, I think my time is almost, we developed a new theory that uh, shows that the real noise forcing, ocean forcing is necessary for heat flux ST correlation reversal from positive to negative. And also we develop a practical method to estimate low frequency ocean atmosphere forcing magnitude and uh, the time scale from monthly data, raw monthly data. And we apply this to North Atlantic and uh, show that ocean forcing in the North Atlantic, the variance is about four times bigger. Uh, and uh, the time scale is longer than one year, while the ST time scale, damping time scale is three months. So uh, I guess I'll uh, stop here unless there are questions. I have lots of, actually there are more questions than I can answer uh, from here because this problem. But I think the key is that uh, the problem is still, it's not completely solved, right? It's far from solved. So we think there's ocean force in there. The ultimate question is still, what is it? Okay, so right now it's kind of uh, implied. Uh, it has to be, there. yeah, I'll stop here. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Liu, for that great presentation. I gotta say that I like that image that you put there <laughs> with the doctor. Um, so I'm gonna open up the floor for questions from the audience, if anybody has one for Dr. Liu. Remember, you can uh, raise your hand feature on the right panel on GoToWebinar. And I'll unmute you on this side. Um, I have a question on the chat from Matt Newman. Um, how do, do you want to, I, I, can, I can read it or do you want yeah, to? Yeah, can you uh, read it? How, okay. do I... how does atmosphere ocean coupling factor into this especially if it's non-local and if the time scales also depend upon the spatial structure of the coupling? Yes, a good question. And the non-local is a big problem, okay? So uh, uh, I think there will be issue when you have a non-local. And uh, so this is more, uh, basically the, this can be extended further, non-local, yeah. So right now I think, uh, uh, the non-local, especially for the ocean forcing, uh, will be uh, very important. So right here, the atmosphere, you use heat flux. So whatever effect, teleconnection, doesn't matter. It just knows whatever heat flux forcing here. So it is eventually, what is response for the ocean forcing that is the most interesting, okay? What, it comes back to what is this ocean forcing? It cannot be from atmosphere. That's what we show. But if it's from ocean, what is it? Actually, we further show that it cannot be ecumen drift. We, 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 we have uh, further paper analysis on this. So then what is this? It, it's a question to be studied, yeah. All right, do we have another question for Dr. Louis at the moment? Don't be shy, we're a scientist here and we're here to answer your questions. Going once, okay. yeah. going twice. <laughs> oh, okay, so we have one. Uh, go ahead, Susan. I'm gonna unmute he, I'm with you here. Oh, great. Hi, thanks, uh, the new Liu. That was a great talk. Um, Thank you. So, uh, if I understand the talk, you're saying that this, the slow, uh, the slow variability in the ocean um, kind of takes over the heat flux at low frequencies. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Uh, so does that give us some hope for predictability in the sense that if we can get our head around what's driving that? Sure. Low I mean, variability? that's the whole party grill. We, we are trying to find the low frequency one. Yeah. And, uh, but I have to say, I didn't continue uh, the next part. Uh, the time scale, at least for the observation we find now in this millitude, 
is about only about one year. It's not really decadal. Okay. So, yeah. So, and, and I, now I started with some further work. I doubt this is the one responsible for this multi-decadal variability. Okay. It is true, but some part of the ocean variability, but it may not be the multi-decadal that we are most interested in. So there are still lots of work to do. Great. And the other thing I didn't mention, I didn't show that, uh, there is a robust inconsistency between model and observation in subpolar ocean. In the mid latitude, you see they are all the same. In the subpolar ocean, OA flux is always positive, never reverse sign. In observation, subpolar region, actually the reverse sign, even stronger, the ocean force is more dominant. It's like I was thinking, you know, that's what fits, fits our intuition. I don't know if it fits because uh, the observational bias or not. And we check this, not just spear. We start with spear and check the, uh, the GFDM model, check the CMA model. That's a very robust feature. So uh, I don't know, something interesting there. Okay, terrific, thank you. Yeah. All right, do we have, yes, we have one more question from Stephen Grupis. Let me unmute you. Go ahead. Yes, thank you for the talk. Um, I may have missed it, but could you say, do you come down one way or the other on the on the the Clement versus Zhang debate? Oh, <laughs> you want me to take sides? <laughs> I don't want to take sides. Uh, basically, I think they, you know, I think in the study of this, each pro, uh, well, I think in this case, from my study, uh, there will be ocean forcing, and the ocean forcing magnitude, as I diagnose in Midland North Atlantic, it's not negligible. It's in the North Atlantic, it's about twice as far as variance is concerned, twice as bigger in magnitude than the atmospheric stochastic forces. So that's that's what I have uh, so far. And uh, uh, so what Mark, and uh, what nice thing, Mark did add on Hanselman, he added ocean stochastic forcing, but he didn't add ocean forcing damping. Then Rong Zhang added ocean forcing damping. Then you will need a finite ocean forcing to reverse the sign. But while he, they all in study mostly focused on the low frequency limit. So they didn't study how you transition from low to high. So in this case, uh, the theory is more complete, showing that if you have a reversal from low frequency, from positive to negative with low pass, it has to be a red noise ocean force. Otherwise, you are either positive or negative. You never reverse sign. Great, thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Liu? I'm not seeing any, so I'm gonna thank you once again, Dr. Liu, for that great presentation. Thank you. And uh, I'm gonna move on to our next presenter. Let me... Sorry. Our next presentation is by Dr. Fabrizio Falasca. He's a postdoc working in the Koran Institute of Mathematical Sciences at New York University. He's interested in developing and applying methods stemming from dynamical systems and statistical physics to study climate variability and its response to external forcing across a vast range of spatial and temporal scales. Dr. Falasca, thank you so much for joining us. At this time, I will turn over the controls to you. Uh, can you see my screen? Show my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, okay, well, thank you for the nice introduction. And uh, thank you all for being here. Today I'm going to um, present some relatively new results on uh, exploring the non-stationarity of coastal sea level probability distributions, both from uh, observational data sets and from models. This work done together with Andrew and Laura here in NYU, current, uh, with Stephen and Ming in uh, GFDL and with John June in University of Arizona. So this is an outline of the talk. I will very briefly introduce what we know in terms of uh, linear uh, sea level trends, both in global scales and regional scales. And then I will make the case that climate change uh, usually involves or may involve 
changes in probability distribution, so not just changes in the mean of climate observables. And therefore, I will uh, present a new methodology to quantify uh, sources of changes in probability distribution from time series. And a great part of the talk is going to be uh, related to the methodology itself. And, um, and then I will show a first application of this method uh, on uh, sea level probability distribution, focusing on tight gauges and then on GFDL model outputs. Then we jump to conclusions and to ongoing and future work, mainly uh, related to quantifying drivers of sea level change uh, through causal inference methods. Okay, so let me start with some very brief motivation. Um, focus on the left part of this slide. Here you see global mean sea level on the, on the um, y-axis. And on the x-axis you see time going from 1900 uh, to 2020. This is coming from a plot, plot of Frederick Settle in 2020. And I would like you to focus on the blue curve, which shows the observed reconstructed sea level change uh, from observations. And as you can see, there is a, a clear uh, sea level rise. You see a global level from observations. Uh, and recently, we see a, a, a relatively fast acceleration. Now, if you then focus on regional sea level, you can see that the situation is way more complicated than what it would appear from global mean sea level time series. And in fact, we see trends, um, but there is a strong heterogeneity in this trend. With places such as the Western Pacific with very large trends, and so sea level rise, sea level rising very rapidly, and other places such as the Eastern Pacific uh, with very small trends and in some places actually almost negative. And this is related to local variability, uh, such as local variability in winds, storm, ocean heat uptake, in general modes of variability. Now the main point here is that whether when we look at global mean or regional sea level, um, usually what we do is to quantify trends in sea level time series, uh, by focusing on linear trends. And to do so, we, one of the uh, main tools of climate scientists is linear regression. Um, this is very useful, uh, but what it does is to allow us to quantify changes in the mean of the distribution. In, the case, in this case, the mean of sea level condition to time. And it does so by ignoring higher order changes. Now, also when we study extreme, often, not always, but often, we fit extreme value distribution and then we try to understand how they may change in the future by the only assumption that the main changes come from the mean. However, both from adaptation and to really understand how climate is changing, uh, uh, both from anthropogenic or natural variability, um, it is useful and important to quantify changes in shapes of the distribution too. So we present a relatively uh, simple and cheap method to actually do so, uh, quantifying both changes in quantiles and moments of a distribution, and specifically quantifying how independent changes in moments, so changing moments one at a time, can explain the observed changes in distribution. And I will do so pedagogically, starting from uh, a synthetically generated time series. Here you have some variable, let's call it S, and here you have time, T. And as you can see, this time series, uh, this, this, uh, this distribution is changing over time. And in fact, I can compute its linear regression and I will see that there is a linear trend and the slope, of, and the slope is actually positive. So the mean is changing over time. As I compute changes for the mean, I can also compute changes for the median or what we refer to as quantile 0 0.5. And in fact, what you can do is, is also quantify changes in quantile 0.05 and 0.95. And I can do this through a methodology that is called quantile regression. And as you can see here, these different quantiles of the distribution are changing in different rate, at different rates, with the smaller quantiles changing slower than the higher quantiles. What I can do is a uh, next step, is to actually focus not just on those three quantiles, but in all of them. Here I'm going from the quantile uh, 0 0.05 to 0 0.5, the median, and 0 0.95. Here on the x-axis, you see the probability level at, why, at, at which the uh, quantile has been computed. And uh, at the y-axis, you see the slope of these quantiles. 
And the main point is that this picture can give you a lot of information on how the distribution is changing. In fact, all quantized lots are positive. This means that the mean of the distribution is increasing, is moving to larger values. On top of that, if you fix yourself on the median, you see that there, is a, there are symmetric changes over the median, with larger quantiles change, changing faster and smaller quantiles changing slower. This gives you a first information that the variance of the distribution, not only the mean, is also changing. Now, generally, though, we would like to focus on higher order moments too, not just the mean and the variance. We would like to focus on many, many time series, and we're going to focus on up to 12,000 time series in this talk. And then we would like to um, infer statistical significance with some bootstrap uh, methodology. So we need a way to actually interpret these results while still retaining uh, information of changes in quantiles. One way to do so was first proposed by uh, Karen McKinnon in a beautiful paper of 2016. And the strategy is the following, construct a framework to link both changes in quantiles and moments of a distribution in the same, in the same, uh, frame, in the same model. So here, inspired by this idea, we're gonna try to um, uh, develop a rigorous method to do so. So let me start with a quantile of a distribution. Here I call QP the quantile at, le at probability level P. So Q, P equals 0 0.5, mean the median of the distribution. And then we refer to M1, M2, M3, M4 as mean, variance, skewness, and cortosis. It is sort of a notational crime, but it is useful for uh, what we're going to do later. And we assume that this uh, uh, distribution are not stationary, so this quantile depends on time, and depends on time through the moments of the distribution infinite moments, but here we do a severe truncation and focus just on the first four. Now, we look at the simple case of linear changes. So we can write linear changes in quantiles by simple application of a chain rule. And what you will see here is that changes in quantiles depend on, changes in quantiles over time depends on how moments change over time times how individual quantiles change when you change moments uh, of the distribution. So we were interested in trying to understand how to quantify this stuff. And uh, luckily for us, two gentlemen, uh, both Cornish and Fisher, were thinking about these similar questions uh, in the late 30s. And uh, what they were showing is that it is what they derived is what we now know as Cornish-Fisher expansion which allows you to actually approximate the quantile of any distribution as deviation from the known quantiles of a Gaussian distribution. So of a standard normal with zero mean and variance one. So that the quantile P of the true distribution can be written as the mean plus the, the skewness of the, sorry, the, the standard deviation of the distribution times a function. If this function, if the, if the probability distribution is Gaussian, the skewness M3 and cortosis on four are zero. So we have an exact equality. And if it's, if it's not Gaussian, we take into account deviation from Gaussian with this formula. Let me give you an example. Here on the left, we have a beta distribution that I generated. You can see it's pretty non-Gaussian. And uh, here is the first four moments. Instead of thinking in terms of probability distribution function, you can consider quantile function, QP. And uh, this is the ground truth for this quantile function for which we know the analytical form. Now we can make the assumption of Gaussianity. And so to do so, we can write the quantile function simply by knowing the mean and variance of the distribution. You will end up with this uh, wrong uh, version of quantile function. But what you can do is to put these four numbers that you have from data alone and plug it into this cornish fisher expansion what you would obtain is this reconstruction of the ground truth without knowing anything about the ground truth. So given this formula, what we're trying to do is not understanding what is the relationship between quantile and moments, but how quantile change when you change moments into each one at a time. So we're gonna make an assumption of relatively small deviation from Gaussianity, which sort of makes sense in our case, given that we are looking at C-level and C-level anomalies. And I'm happy to talk about it later if you're interested. And we derive uh, these four polynomials, 
that are also plotted here. Here on the x-axis is the probability level, and here you have these four polynomials that tell you how one time of the distribution change when you change moments one at a time. And I can say one at a time because this, these, uh, these are polynomial, which are mid polynomials of the quantile function of a standard normal are actually orthogonal to each other in the zero one, um, uh, in, in, this, in this zero, zero one domain. So this is interesting to us because we can derive this formula which links slopes in quantiles that we can compute through quantile regression to slopes in moments that we do not have given these polynomials that we have from theory. And so by a simple um, linear regression, we are able to fit changes in moments. Importantly, these moments uh, quantify not just how moments change in time, but how the distribution, how changes in distribution can be explained by individual and independent changes in each one of the moments. Let me give you an example, focus on the first panel, so panel A. Here you have a Gaussian distribution with mean and variance that are drifting in time, so they're changing. And here on the right you have the quantile regression and the projection over this uh, polynomial. And then we can do some statistical tests uh, related to bootstrapping that I do not have time to go through. And what this will tell us is that changes come mainly from the mean and the variance and not from the other moments that you would expect. Same we can do for a beta distribution, where here the prescribed changes come from variance, skewness, and kurtosis, but not from the mean. And we are able to find exactly the sources of changes. And this is a type of time series we are going to look at in observations. This is uh, tight gauges uh, from Balboa, which is a port close to Panama City, uh, from 1910 to 2020 almost. Um, and, and here you, sh you see this uh, quantile regression and the projection over this polynomial with mean and variance uh, chosen to uh, identify to be statistically significant changes. Okay, now what about an application? We are going to focus on the coastal sea level rise and we're going to start from tight gauges. So we focus on tight gauges. These are downloaded from uh, uh, University of Hawaii Sea Level Center. These are daily tight gauges going from 1970 to 2017. Whenever you see a field dot, this means that we have significant changes. Whenever you see a X, it means not significant changes. The main point here is that uh, the majority of tight gauges, almost all of them, are actually changing. I mean, the, the sea level at that location is changing and it's changing in the mean. And in the majority of them is actually rising, uh, with maximum actually along the east coast of US and in Japan too. And um, however, if you look at higher order moments, you see that the majority of these higher order moments are actually uh, not significant. So at least at first order, we can explain changes in probability distribution of sea level at the coast as a shift of the distribution to larger values without changes in shapes. Now, uh, um, um, a good critique of, of this analysis would be that we are focusing only on 50 years and maybe we would need more years to actually identify uh, changes in higher order moments. So here we focus on more than, on tight gauges that has more than 80 years of data. And uh, unfortunately for these tight gauges, we only have this observation, but at least for this observation, we also see that the main changes come from the mean and not from higher order mode. Okay, so this motivated uh, the, the question that came after this, which is how do we, do we expect um, uh, sea level to change in future projections? To do so, we rely on, a, a, on, a, on GFDL CM4 run, which is GFDL CM4 is a state-of-the-art climate model. And um, one good thing about climate models, even if they come with their own biases, is that actually we can focus on different uh, parts of sea level. So this is a sea level decomposition that we consider and the expert behind is Stephen. Um, this is published in a, in a paper of Ocean Model in 2012. We disregard changes in the global mean coming from thermostatic sea level rise. And we focus on dynamic sea level plus inverse barometer. You can derive this from a hydrostatic balance. And uh, the first one, the dynamic sea level, um, you can think of it 
at first order as changes coming from ocean circulation, where this term, where PB is the ocean bottom pressure, quantify changes in water column mass. The second part quantify changes in local steric effects. And the second one is the inverse barometer phenomena, which is related to changes in sea level driven by local changes in sea level pressure. You can think of it as the changes driven by convective processes such as hurricanes and so on. So we're going to focus on dynamics level pass inverse barometer. And the first test was to actually consider the historical run to see differences from, uh, uh, from, from tide gauges. And as you can see that from 1970 to 2014, actually also in the model, we see that the changes can be explained by a shift of the mean of the distribution without changes in shapes. But what happens if we continue to add uh, CO2 in the atmosphere, at least in this model, and uh, the next step will be to actually look at other models and ensemble of runs, we see that if we consider a 1% CO2 run, and a 1% CO2 run means that we start from pre-industrial um, um, uh, control run, so pi control run, pre-industrial uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, and that every year we add 1% of that value for 150 years. We do not consider the first 50 years, so which we see that in majority of location uh, there is, uh, there is a, a change that comes from you know, an anthropo uh, anthropogenic signal. We look at the last 100 years where changes are almost linear. On the left panel, you see changes from dynamic sea level only, which I remind you is mainly driven from ocean circulation and you know, local steric effects. And the right ax on the on the right panel, on the right column, um, you can see changes when we add the inverse barometer effect. And what you can see here is that in these runs, uh, we see an emergence of changes in shapes of the distribution. Uh, with changes in variance and skewness are already present in the dynamic sea level only, and all changes in higher order moments get amplified when adding to the inverse barometer. Now, for now, um, the main um, problem we tackled was to actually analyze this data, and now we are trying to actually um, understand where are these changes coming from. Um, but a few uh, points coming from the literature may be this. Uh, we see that the shifts in kurtosis are linked only I can only be seen when we look at the inverse barometer effect. So this is possibly in agreement with recent results of Presley and Cato in 2022 observe a decrease in cycle number in synopsic projection. We also see that uh, there is a large increase in skewness, which is present in the dynamics level only and doesn't change really when you add the inverse barometer. Is consistent with papers of Pinto et al. showing an increase in, eastern, in, in intensification of westerly winds in that region. And uh, um, uh, shifts in skewness and kurtosis uh, in the Mediterranean, possibly pointing to a decrease in medicines as suggested to Gonzalez, Aleman, et al. in 2019, even if these results are also um, sensitive to choices of models and to different ensembles. So this is an example of one of this time series. Uh, this is considered in the Mediterranean Sea. And as you can see, changes uh, in quantile regression are here, uh, qu yeah, quantified uh, by quantile regression are here, and this is the projections. And here they would tell you this, these changes, would tell you changes are in the mean, skewness, and kurtosis. And in fact, if you consider the first 40 years of the time series and the last 40 years, you can in fact see that what this uh, statistical model predicts is the changes in histogram that we can see. Um, so as a conclusion, uh, we are proposing a general statistical model to study significant changes in both quantiles. It can be seen if you want as a generalization of what we have from linear regression by also quantifying uh, changes in higher order moments. Changes in daily sea level in observation can be explained by solely a shift in the mean of distribution, and the CM4 model agrees with observation in the historical period. And uh, in the 1% CO2 run, we see an emergence of higher order changes. Now, I, I have 50 seconds or one minute more to show you one next step. Uh, apart from the application of this model to different ensemble members and different models, 
Um, two questions we're interested in here. One is how do climate observable change in time? And I showed you a model to actually do so statistically, and uh, there may be more work to do on, on the future about it, but it's, it, it is working for us right now. And then what drives such changes? What is the dynamics behind it? And to do so, and to do this from data, so taking advantage of the large amount of data that we have from GFDL data, for example, and also observation now, we're developing a new framework for dimensionality reduction and causal inference based mainly on linear response theory and fluctuation dissipation relation, such that from a very uh, complex spatial temporal climate system, we can uh, divide it in small regions or boxes or indices, and then trying to reconstruct statistically the circulation and trying to answer questions on the sea level side, trying to, for example, understand the link between open ocean dynamics and regional variability. This is a work in progress. Uh, we are wrapping up the paper together with Pavel and and, uh, and if you want to see more about this work, uh, we have a paper on archive that is here. And uh, yeah, thank you all very much for listening to all right, thank you, Dr. Falaska, for that great presentation. I'm going to open up the floor now for questions. Timothy has a question. I'm trying to unmute you here. Let me see if that works. I see you type the question. I'm going to read it. I'm in trouble on muting you. Uh, did you analyze GFTL historical simulations and verify that your analysis gives the same result as in observations? We did. We did. Yeah, it was what I was presented before. Let me go back there. Okay. So this is the historical run of uh, GFDL CM4 um, by looking at uh, daily sea level everywhere in the coast from 1970 to 2014. Um, so here we are only focused on dynamic sea level and inverse barometer effects. So you, you, you have to remove the, 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 the signal coming from global, global mean thermostatic changes in sea level. Uh, so you you could add to this uh, um, uh, a positive number, okay? Everything gets shifted to positive numbers. So it agrees in the sense from what we are trying to tell, in the sense of the fact that changes come mainly from the mean, but not from higher order moments. So in this sense, it agrees with observation, and it you know it sets the analysis then for what we see in projection of one percent CO2, for which we will see changes in higher order moments. All right. Do we have more questions for Dr. Falaska? Um, Timothy says, thanks. Sorry for asking a question. You already answered. <laughs> no problems. Uh, any more questions? Going once. Going twice. All right, so I would like to thank everybody for joining us uh, in this set of presentations in our series on the Decatur Climate Variability and Predictability Studies. I would like to thank today's presenters, Dr. Lou and Dr. Flaska, for taking the time to share their work with us. The recording of today's webinar will be available within the next week on our website, uh, cpo.noaa.gov slash cvp. Uh, we hope that you join us next week uh, for the next seminar. I'm gonna uh, pull up the next week's presenters. And I think you should be seeing this one. So next week we have, so we had a change. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Amy Clement from the University of Miami. She's not gonna be with us. Uh, but one of her uh, postdoc students will do the presentation. Uh, he is Cheng Fei He from the University of Miami. Atlantic multi-decadal climate variability is mostly forced. 
and Martha, Dr. Martha Buckley from George Mason University. Uh, she will do uh, how does ocean dynamics impact predictability of the Atlantic sea surface temperature. So that's next Thursday at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, same link, same time, uh, same software. So thank you again to all of our audience and to our presenters. We'll see you next week. Have a nice weekend, everybody.